uh, there is there is a uh, an an uh, a, a surgical sort of uh, uh, research day today that I wasn't aware of. So I think a lot more people would be interested, and they may trickle in. They've they've reassured me. So Shiraz is an associate professor and academic director of surgical intervention trials unit in, at the Newfield Department of Surgery at Oxford. And he also has a very important affiliation with the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Um, he qualified in medicine from Cambridge in 2007. He trained uh, in, in, in research and surgery at Cambridge, London, Seattle, Stockholm, and Oxford, including an NIHR doctoral research and clinical trials fellowship and an academic clinical lectureship. One PhD was apparently not enough, so he has two. So Imperial College London, he developed a breath test for esophageal gastric cancer. And at the Karolinska Institute, he did a PhD in complex statistical modeling. So exactly what we want, really a nice intersection of uh, physiology and stats and epi. He has a strong interest in the management of benign and malignant upper GI disease, over 270 publications. So we have to ask why not 300, but 270 is okay. I'm teasing you. <laughs> it's, it's a huge <laughs> number. And he's a member and chair of several important surgical associations and committees. And um, he focuses on the design and implementation of challenging trials and integration of novel technology to improve clinical outcomes. And he's gonna to talk to us today about um, uh, sort of monitoring and studying uh, uh, surgical uh, procedures and outcomes uh, with big data. It's up to you, Charles. Perfect. So, so first of all, I'd really like to thank Dr. Dasgupta for the the invitation here. I, I'm really honoured actually to to be here, and I, I really enjoy this um this kind of uh, this kind of presentation because partly because of the fact that hopefully I'll talk to people who aren't that many surgeons as well as hopefully some surgeons will come in, but hopefully not that many surgeons. So hopefully it'll give me a different perspective on, on what I'm doing. So um um. I'm going to talk to you really about how we measure performance in surgical care, healthcare systems. And, and really, um, um, these are my disclosures, um, which are not really relevant to this talk. But there are, there are four main things that I really want to talk about, actually, which is really, one is uh, what we currently actually measure, how we're actually measuring it, um, and really what I feel we actually should be measuring, at least within surgery. And then perhaps most importantly are really my thoughts about how we could potentially utilize data or really novel clinical trial design to actually meaningfully impact patient care. So when we talk about measurable outcomes, um, they're often equated with quality. And really what the things that we typically measure are things that are easy to measure in surgery. So these are things like mortality or morbidity or length of hospital stay or reoperation partly because of the fact that we can assign a number to it. And that's always very easy to measure within, within traditional data sets. When we start to get a bit more into your disease specific area, for me, I work in a lot of um, uh, data sets with cancer and particularly esophageal and gastric cancer. So I'm very interested in things around recurrence, but also uh, resection margins, whether or not we remove the cancer as part of the operation and ultimately the long-term survival of the patient. However, when you really actually speak to patients about what they want to know, they really want to know what their quality of life is going to look like after having a surgery. And they want to know if they have a benign condition, whether or not their symptoms are going to get better. And I think that's probably the Achilles heel of many surgical data sets and much of the epidemiology that's been conducted in surgery in the past. So broadly speaking, we sort of fall into three main kind of data sets that we typically work with in surgery. They're administrative, they're registry-based or they're institutional. And I'll talk about each of these in turn. But really with these outcomes come measurable factors that are often linked to quality, but the link is, is, is somewhat sometimes um, uh, a little bit questionable. So we talk a lot about hospital volume and surgery and surgeon volume and hospital factors. And I'll talk about each of these in turn. Um, and, and then the other things that we talk about are patient factors. And these are things that are really come out of registries such as disease specific risk factors and also treatment factors, which may be associated with clinical outcome. And then there's also specialty specific factors or staffing levels or changes in practice that have evolved and sort of the introduction of minimally invasive surgery, for example, is a good one. And again, I'll talk to you about whilst we binarize it, it's not really a binary factor. And again, these three data set, these kind of three types of data sets are commonly used in surgery to really um, look at these in more detail. 
Now, when you start to think about administrative versus registry versus uh, institutional data sets, um, they're, they're all quite different and they have their pros and their cons. So in terms of the positives of an administrative level data set, I mean, this is typically a data set which is often used for numeration for a hospital. So it's population level. It's usually unbiased by, by its nature. Um, when you compare it to, uh, say, for example, a cancer registry, that's often disease specific and often is utilized to try to look at what are what is excellence or what is really good, well-performing hospitals. And then you have institutional data sets, which really give you a really good idea in terms of granularity of data. The negatives of administrative data sets really is that the data accuracy is somewhat lacking in many ways. And that's really a reflection of data coding because obviously you put in by a coder, typically you may not really know what's happened to the patient. The negatives of registry-based data is really the validity of the data. How well is that data been validated both on a, on a national level and also on an institutional level, both by case ascertainment, but also by case validity. And secondly is really um, whether or not there's a degree of selection bias of what you're putting into that registry. So for example, if you have a surgical registry, you may only put the cases in that have survived. And in all honesty, that, that, that's the Achilles heel of many traditional surgical registries in the past. And then finally, when you talk about institutional data sets, they're, 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 you know, they form huge amounts of publications that I see and I review a lot of these institutional publications, but they're heavily limited by publication bias. So really what I think the primary uses are is that I think if you're trying to look at a, a problem at a population level, you use an administrative data set and that kind of gives you the scale of the issue. Trying to really try to get down into the nitty gritty of what's really maybe driving some of the changes that you're seeing, you need a bit more granularity to your data. So you go with a registry based data set. And if we're really trying to look at what defines excellence or what really good outcomes are, you probably start to look at institutional publications. And then I just want to talk about my area of interest now, which is moved towards trial design and, and sort of traditionally kind of trying to look at the, the link, the kind of the commonality between epidemiology and surgical trials or randomized control trials. So traditional randomized control trial design is rigorous for a single variable. It's perspective in design. And the idea is, is that you eradicate biases. Problems with it in surgery particularly is that it's expensive, it's time consuming. Um, and often what you have is you have a really selected population of patients operated on by really great centers and that doesn't really reflect what the average surgeon performing the average kind of operation really looks like um, in the population. And now if you compare that to sort of observational or registry-based studies, you have a large unselected population of patients and you have a large number of events. So typically you'll get, you know, some really good kind of outcomes. But the problem is, is that you get some variability in data quality. And I think in all honesty, you're, you're probably unable to, convert, to account for several of the confounders that we know that influence the outcomes of these patients. So what I'm moving a lot more towards, and I think um, in you know, cardiovascular disease is, is, is relatively well established, but in cancer, not so much yet, but will come soon, is the concept of a registry-based randomized control trial. And this has the advantages of randomization. It's a less selected population, which traditionally hinders much of surgical research. And, and typically what you do is you use the infrastructure of your registry to embed your randomized control trial within that. And therefore your follow-up is collected as part of the trial through the registry. And that really drives down the cost of the trial in many ways. There are some disadvantages around it and it's usually around the fact that it's not suitable for every type of trial, but I'll, I'll get into that in a bit more detail. And graphically, this really illustrates what I'm talking about, which is on the bottom line, you have a randomized control trial whereby you randomize A versus B. You have a really small number of patients, typically compared to the general population. So it's relatively highly selected in terms of the inclusion and exclusion criteria. The top line represents an observational study where you have the whole population, but again, you have variable data um, and it's a large unselected population. But really a registry-based randomized control trial might give you the benefits of both, whereby you have the randomization, but you have a large enough population to really study what you want to look at. So I just wanted to talk a bit about big data and some of the work that I've done really, I guess, using uh, big data. And I, I really hate that kind of term, but but it, but it's a commonly used term. So so really, um, it, it is what we what it is. So um, um, I would be remiss, really, if I didn't talk about John Berkmeyer's papers in the New England Journal of Medicine, which I think led to a lot of epidemiology or study of epidemiology in in, in surgical outcomes. And, you know, I'm an upper GI surgeon, so I focus primarily in performing esophagectomy, like uh, Professor Ferry in your department. 
Um, but but essentially, this paper was a landmark paper because it showed that as you increase your hospital volume in the United States, this was again an administrative data set. Um, um, uh, it shows a stepwise reduction in mortality for esophagectomy. Then they looked at surgeon volume, and again, they published New England Journal of Medicine a year later, and they showed that in actual fact that this change in, in outcome may be driven both on an institutional level, but also by the way that surgeons are performing the technique. So if you're a higher volume surgeon, your outcome is better. Um, and I think what's really important is when you publish epidemiological data, people don't go the next step. So they don't really look at whether or not their publication had any influence on practice. And, and to be fair to him, I applaud John Berkmeyer because he did this 10 years later. He looked at whether or not his previous publication looked at, uh, led to any change in outcome in it, or, or potentially if there was any changes in outcome over time. And he showed, at least in the setting of esophagectomy, that there was a trend towards around 32% of um, patients really moving towards a higher volume center, which I think is really great to show the power of how these administrative data sets could potentially be used. Now, uh, I'm from the UK, as you can uh, tell by my introduction and my accent, but it, but essentially we published this document based upon John Berkmeyer's work when it was originally presented in, uh, in 2001. And this led to the centralization of esophageal and gastric cancer in 2005. And, and really what this meant was, and I think we were one of the first countries to really do this, whereby this is a map of the um, number of centers who were performing either a esophageal or a gastric cancer surgery in 2002. And this is the map as it currently looks today. So we really have gone a long way in terms of centralization of practice over time. And really what I was interested to know is from an administrative data set in the United States, which was the nationwide inpatient sample, I compared it to an administrative data set in England. And really what the frequency plots show is, is that in the, in the United States, there's a real clustering of very low volume centers. This highest mark is the number of centers, high sorry, peak is the number of centers that are performing less than two esophagectomies a year. While in England, we have a much more even spread of our data, partly because of the fact that we have centralization of service. And really what that means to the patients is that if you look at the service as a whole, comparing the United States and in England, that the mortality rate from esophagectomy is substantially higher in the United States than it is in England. However, when you look at your super volume centers, comparing both countries, the United States, higher, highest volume centers still do better. So it really implies that there's a lack of centralization within um, uh, the US um, currently for, for, the, for the treatment of esophageal and gastric cancer. And then um, obviously that's interesting, but that's using administrative data. So you can't really adjust for all the factors that are really important in a cancer operation. So then as part of my affiliation in Karolinska, I really wanted to get into this. So I, so I went to um, the Dutch and I asked them for their national audit or their national registry data. And then I wanted to ask the Swedish for exactly the Swedish same data set. So I looked at basically patients who have esophageal adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma, which are two histological subtypes. But basically what, what, the, what this table shows is that if you are, if you are treated in, in um, Sweden, you are much less likely to have a curative uh, treatment whether that be by surgery or whether that be by chemotherapy or radiotherapy. So that is really remarkable. And it's almost a, you know, a five-fold change in, in, in some situations. And that leads to a tangible difference in survival from exactly the same type of cancer with exactly the same type of stage in two European countries. Um, and, I, and I think that's really, in my opinion, I think that's unacceptable in 2021 when the paper was published, but, but that's the data as it sits. And really in England, what we have in terms of cancer registries now is we have the National Cancer Audit. And I think this was one of the best, the best things that we've done in the UK. So this was originally published in 2011 and it became mandated by our government that every patient with esophageal and gastric cancer had to be registered within this audit. And particularly any patient having an operation, all of the data had to be collected in a very, very, very granular fashion. So what this allowed us to do is this really allows us to look at, for example, the number of patients who are having minimally invasive resections in the UK, which is still remarkably low, even in 2021. But we're allowed to really look at our data. And what we sh showed over time, over the 10-year period of the, of the national audit, at least being seen in the UK, is that as a country, our 30-day and our 90-day mortality, I think, are, are pretty good, sitting at around 2% and 4%. And that's for the whole country from esophagectomy. And bear in mind, only about 15 to 20 years ago, we used to have mortality rates of about 25 to 30%. So, so there's been some real substantial improvements. 
And likewise, our, five, our three year overall survival currently sits at about 60%. So this would compare with anywhere in the world. And this survival data is very granularly, uh, very granular in nature and very robustly collected because it's linked to the Office of National Statistics, which is whereby when a patient dies, their, their mortality data is immediately inputted. So I think it, it's very accurate for that. And really uh, what, you know, one of the things I'm interested in is, is that is really trying to see whether or not we can apply some sort of machine learning algorithms to some of this data. So there was a, there was a, there is, I should say, a um, um, machine learning tool which has now been published um, and has been presented from our national audit. And really, what that that does is is that it, you can put in a patient's data, and it will tell you the predicted risk of uh, of ninety day mortality and three year overall survival if that patient was to have an operation within the UK, and that's based upon the national audit which I previously presented. Now, what I think the, in my opinion, the Achilles heel of a lot of these machine learning papers and and sort of uh, this kind of data is, is that they don't try to go the external, the next step, which is to externally validate the data. So I asked our European colleagues for the Ensure data set, uh, which is a kind of a, um, a national, uh, sorry, an international European study um, collecting data from several, several centers. And really what we did was we applied the same uh, variables that were included in the, in the, in the national audit tool into this, into this data set as well. And we looked at the performance of the machine learning algorithm. So the graph on the uh, the figure on the right really shows that this is the machine learning algorithm for different risk prediction groups. And what it shows is, is that when you get out to the kind of um, the, the, the lowest sort of survival group and the highest survival group, the machine learning algorithm doesn't really work that well. Well, when you use a straightforward Cox proportional hazard model ratio, it actually works pretty well compared to um, compared to the machine learning algorithm of the random survival forest. So what I would say is that um, there's a lot a lot of stuff around machine learning algorithms and different types of techniques, and I think they're very interesting and very exciting. But but I would um, hold on to the fact that they really do need to be externally validated in the population that you're looking at. So what we have in England is we have a, a data set for um, studying benign diseases, and I've done this a lot in the past, called HES, which is our kind of administrative data set. And, and that really um, is a way that hospitals are remunerated for the care that they give. The data in its ethos is relatively basic because in terms of patients, you get kind of age, gender, ethnicity, and their socioeconomic status, but you don't really get much about the disease severity as such. So from this, it, it's allowed me to study things like esophageal perforation. Um, so I published this a few years ago now in the American Journal of um, Gastroenterology, but, but this was a really important paper at the time because it showed that our mortality from esophageal perforation was around 45% um, at 90 days in 2001. And that has reduced somewhat to 35% in 2012, but it, by no means perfect. And it was the first study that really established that there was a strong volume outcome relationship shown from the management of esophageal perforations. So but the larger the number of uh, perforations you manage, the better your outcomes were for the patient. But this data set is limited because I can't tell you why. I have no idea as to why from the data set that I was currently using. Likewise, when I, I looked at parasophageal hernia, um, um, we again showed a strong volume outcome relationship associated with this, um, with the funnel plot on, on the left-hand curve really implying that there's a real normalization of outcome. And I, I tend to use a technique called risk-adjusted QSIM, um, which is a traditional um, technique used to model learning curve for surgeons or proficiency gain curve, but you can model any continuous variable. And it's essentially looking at your risk uh, predicted, risk-adjusted mortality against your actual observed mortality. So the expected my, the minus the observed. And at some point, they equal each other, which is what you call your change points. So your change points are around 11 cases in this, which means the threshold for managing patients with acute parasophageal hernia on an annual level should be at least 11 if you want to see a reduction in your mortality. And likewise, when we looked at um, um, what I wanted to do was what I wanted to put basically emergency care in, in one box and your cancer care in the other box. So I wanted to say, okay, so if you're a high volume esophagogastric cancer center, for example, uh, Oxford, what do your outcomes from emergency upper GI conditions look like? So therefore, should we be centralizing complex upper GI care in the UK or not? And really what this showed was, was that they showed that for complex 
um, diseases like esophageal perforation, yes, there's a strong relationship between being managed in a high volume cancer center and the outcome of the patient. But for things like parasophageal hernia and for things like perforated peptic ulcer disease, the answers actually no, they can be probably managed in, in any hospital. And when you really start to think about it, it really parallels Berkmeyer's work because things like parasophageal hernia and perforated peptic ulcer disease are quite common conditions with, with relatively lower levels of mortality. So they kind of look a bit like colectomies or gastrectomies. Well, things like esophageal perforation are relatively rare conditions with a very high level of mortality, and they really parallel what Berkmeyer showed with, with esophagectomy in many ways. And then really what I think is great about administrative data is that it allows you to compare countries. So I compared cancer care uh, previously, and then what I was interested in looking at was, was really looking at um, emergencies. And, and this is patients who are over the age of 80, managed in the UK, versus those who are managed in the United States. And it's comparing essentially five pretty common emergency conditions. So appendicitis, abdominal, uh, strangulated or incarcerated abdominal hernia, perforated peptic ulcer disease, again, esophageal perforation and small bowel or large bowel perforation. And what you saw was, was that you saw that in England, there's a, a much higher proportion of patients who are receiving um, no intervention or no surgical intervention, I should say, as part of their care. And as a consequence of that, the standardized mortality rate for all of the conditions was much higher in England than that seen in the United States. Now, what you could say is there are different drivers for allocation of treatment in the United States, particularly because of remuneration, and that, that makes a lot of logical sense. But purely from a data point of view, what we can say from this is that in actual fact, although they may be driven to operate for a particular reason, their outcomes, because they're driven to operate, are actually better across the board in patients over the age of 80. And that's quite important, I think, for us in England to start to think about our thresholds for who we're operating on, and maybe we need to change them. And interestingly, so this paper was published in Annals of Surgery, but it went under five revisions with JAMA. It's one of my one of my uh, saddest moments, I think, in my career, was when we got the final rejection later from JAMA. But, but essentially what they asked us for was they asked us for a mediation analysis. And, and to be fair, I hadn't really used it before. I hadn't really thought about it much. And I think the one thing that for me is a real learning point from this, and I think, you know, look, my one piece of advice to all of you, you know, younger academics really starting out is that you have to learn from every one of your papers and learn from your reviews. So I really learned from this because I didn't have the data. I didn't have the granularity of the data to properly do a mediation analysis. And that's why the paper was rejected. So it's fair enough. It was cutting after five revisions, but 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 it, but it was sort of fair. So that led me to really think about what we were doing when we were studying esophageal perforation. So I really wanted to do a study whereby I had had the data to do the analysis that I wanted to do. So I did a study recently. This has just been accepted, uh, I think, or published last week in, in Annals of Surgery. It's called the Musoic Study. And, and this brought together eight high volume cancer centers in England. And we asked them to look back on their data for the last five years in, in terms of the management of esophageal um, perforation. And what's really important when you start to think about epidemiological data and how you collect your data, you have to start to think about patients. And I think this is why it's quite nice to involve clinicians. And I really like the fact that I still practice um, a lot clinically because it allows me to really think about a patient journey and what's important in terms of the data that we're collecting. So, in terms of timeline, you have to think about the symptoms, the presentation, the diagnosis, and the intervention. But this correlates very well with the data, because in terms of the patient, you have to collect the age, the comorbidities, the BMI, also the etiology of the perforation. At a presentation, I wanted to get the observations of the patients. I wanted to know their physiological status, what their blood tests were like. I also wanted to know, in terms of investigations, what radiology and endoscopy they had. And then also, in terms of surgery, I wanted to know um, what kind of interventions that they had. But for me, what was interesting was, okay, so we centralized cancer care, which meant that if you went to a regional hospital and you have a esophageal cancer, you're transferred to a tertiary center to have your treatment. And that was very clear. Likewise, in esophageal perforation, after the papers that I published in the past, we, we saw a real centralization of esophageal perforation. So if you turned up at your local hospital with esophageal perforation, you were transferred to a tertiary center on the whole, although some patients may not be transferred. And the question was, was, was there a problem if you transferred the patients? I needed the timeline of the patient and I wouldn't be able to get that from any other data set. 
So we were able to collect data and essentially what we showed was that the 90 day mortality in these centralized hospitals was 20%, which compared pretty well to the 40% that I, that I described previously. We were able to get really good data around biochemical parameters such as urea and, and hemoglobin and lymphocytes. And this allowed us to, pro to uh, undertake some machine learning really on the data such as random uh, survival forest and a few other techniques to really create a, a nice kind of calculator based upon the physiological status of the patient, the etiology of the perforation, how big the hole was, the degree of mediastinal contamination, and the, and the way that you treated the patient. And I, and I think putting those things together, it really gives you a really granular data set to study what is a really challenging condition in practice. And also we were able to look at the timeline of the patient. And what was, I think, really important with this is that we showed that it's actually how fast you make the diagnosis of perforation is the most important thing as to whether or not um, the patient does well. And that really is because um, probably what's happening is you, you diagnose the patient with your esophageal perforation with a scan, maybe in the in the referring center, and then you immediately start the treatment. So you keep the patient nearby mouth, you start some antibiotics, you get them onto fluids, and you treat it very seriously, and then you stabilize the patient for transfer. So it's not the fact that the patient, it's not the degree or how long the patient's transferring, it's how quickly you make the diagnosis, um, and that's really, really important. And then you know, one of the areas that I've worked in and I worked in as part of my lectureship um, at Imperial was really around what is important to patients. So I talked a lot about mortality and a lot about, you know, freely available data. But really, when you ask a patient what's important to them, they want to know what their quality of life is going to look like, particularly after a cancer operation. So I did this study called LASER, which was um, at the time was the largest um, European study ever looking at cancer survivorship. So we collected data and quality of life data from just under 900 patients who survived on average a median of three years with no evidence of cancer recurrence. And what was fascinating was, was that these patients were having real problems with a huge number of symptoms, including early feeling of fullness, and up to 25% of patients were still having real problems with tiredness and reduced energy or activity tolerance. And bear in mind that they're more than three years after their esophagectomy. Likewise, we were able to show really in a kind of granular fashion exactly what the most important symptoms to patients are at different points in their recovery. And that led to a whole panacea of research, which, which, um, which I undertook during my time at Imperial, really looking at trying to, well, scientifically correlate changes with the microbiome with some of these symptoms that patients are, are, are developing. And then obviously the question with my mind was, can you model any of this through routinely collected data? And the answer is, to a certain degree, yes. So we, we did this paper again a few years ago, but we looked at what I wanted to know is, um, as, a, as a full disclosure, both my parents are psychiatrists. So I was interested in, in basically what the psychological kind of impact of, of the cancer surgery that I do is. So what we showed was, was that around 14% of patients after a esophagectomy or gastrectomy will have a new onset diagnosis of, of um, anxiety or depression that requires medical therapy. So this was from a, a, G, a GP or a primary care data set, and we linked it to the, the HES data set that I talked about previously. And really what we showed was, was that when you looked at all of the surgical procedures, including anti-reflux surgery, bariatric surgery, HPV resections, esophagectomy or gastrectomy was the one that was associated the most with having a new onset uh, diagnosis of depression or anxiety. And independent of whether or not the patient had a very aggressive cancer by cancer stage, a, newly a new diagnosis of post-optive psychiatric morbidity was associated with a in dramatic increase in one-year mortality, which to me was a a astounding that this, this was happening. And it really highlighted the need of why patients need to have post-optive psychiatric support, which has now actually been inducted into our guidelines in the UK, which I think is uh, a really great achievement of this of this paper. And then, you know, obviously as a surgeon, one of the things that I'm interested in is, is you know, surgical outcomes and, and, and proficiency gain care. And what that means is, is how do we learn? How do we learn as surgeons and how do we learn to perform procedures? And, and so this is a picture of my son, and this is me trying to teach him how to cycle. So typically what would happen is he comes on a bike with me, like you go and observe a case. Then what happens is he goes around on a scooter, so you might go and do a bit of simulation in the lab. And then eventually he'll be on the bike on his own when you're operating in theatre on your own. And, and, and the question in my mind was, can we model how surgeons learn through routinely collected data? 
And the answer is yes. So this data we published in JCO. And, and what this was, was this was from the Swedish Cancer Registry. But what it showed was, was that as surgeons went through their learning curve, which we modeled through risk-adjusted QSIM, as I talked about before, there are profound changes in outcomes for patients. So if you look at, um, for example, 30-day mortality, there's a change from 8% to around 3% before and after a surgeon gets through his learning curve, which is unbelievable in, 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 in the era of the study, in actual fact. And when you think about it, there's so much money pumped into drug trials at the moment and different types of chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and so on and so forth. And, and, and the most that they see is around an 8% change in survival. And here, all I'm saying is, is that whether or not a surgeon is proficient in performing the technique, we'll have an 11% change in that patient's survival. And yet we're not talking about it. And likewise, when we start to think about the introduction of minimally invasive techniques, again, I modeled this through administrative data in the UK, but again, I was able to show that there was a twofold change in 30 day mortality for a patient who is operated on in the early part of a surgeon's learning curve. And again, this is something that we don't talk about when we talk to patients. And if you just think it's the surgeons, it's not. It's actually gastroenterologists as well. This paper we published in gut, and I think we published it in gut mainly because the, the, the nature of the, the data was just was really just astounding, which is that your 30 day mortality in the very early part of, um, of um, endoscopist learning a, a new technique such as endoscopic mucosal resection is around 4.5%. And it drops to around 0.3% afterwards, which is what everyone thinks it should be. And that is unbelievable. When you think about when I talk to you about the 30-day the mortality from esophagectomy in the UK currently sits at three uh, 2%. And we're talking about a 30-day mortality from an endoscopic procedure here sitting around 4.5%. And that's just a consequence of endoscopist learning the technique. But how do we measure quality? So what I've talked to you about is I've talked to you about Okay, so this is the problem. This is the problem with the data that we have. This is the problem with how surgeons learn. But 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 what? How can we get from basically that that outcome data to what's actually happening in the operating theatre? And I think this is the problem with a lot of the data and the and the papers that I published in the past, which is that in actual fact, it's a bit like going around at the end of a battle and just counting up the number of patients who've died. You can't influence the outcome. So so I've tried to really focus my research in moving towards more of the front end and trying to really get into how we can influence, practically influence change in the operating theatre. And I think the importance of this is to understand what we're talking about here. So when you think about surgery, it, it, you write an operation note at the end of a case and you say, okay, I did it by keyhole surgery or whatever. And that's what's recorded. That's what goes into the data set. But it's like we're writing down a piece of music and you can have someone play the music like Mozart, or you can have it someone like play it like my four-year-old child. And they are very different sounding pieces of music. But what you write on the paper is the same. And the exact same principle is true of surgery. And it's like when you bake a cake, you have the recipe for the cake and you can bake it, but you can bake it in so many different ways. And that's the problem with surgical data at the current time is it doesn't tell you how well the operation was performed unless you measure the mortality. And that's not good enough. So um, we've moved to a technique called OCRA, and this is, um, this is a slide actually I borrowed from my wife, but it's a colorectal operation. And essentially what it allows you to do is watch a video of an operation. It allows you to break down the, the operation into a series of tasks, and then look at the errors that occurred within those, within those techniques. And then you can link it to the data to correlate it with patient outcomes. And really what, as I said, it allows you to annotate every step, every movement, every error. And as a consequence of that, you can look at what consequences actually happen to the patient. So really, you can really feed back to surgeons really quickly as to, okay, this is an error that you guys are doing in your, in your surgery and you really need to start to think about it. And it creates the new concept of an error pathway. So if you were just looking at your data, your administrative data and the way you analyzed it at the end, you'd have bleeding or your interruptive or your post-optive transfusion rate. But in actual fact, what you really need to get at is you need to get at how can you change that? So you need to look at which of the errors of these were, which is what video-based analysis and OCRA, in my opinion, allows you to do. And this has been well established now in colorectal surgery. This is a paper from George Hanna's group, who's my long-term mentor from Imperial. And it's a really important paper because it shows that in, a, in the context of a cancer surgical trial, this was a randomized controlled trial in laparoscopic color, uh, colonic resection in the UK, um, and Australia, it showed that patients, surgeons who performed very well on the video when 
and the, bear in mind the the video assessor was blinded to the outcome of the patients their recurrence rate was much better than those surgeons who performed badly so there is something in the way that you perform the operation on the video and correlating it with long-term outcomes for the patient and this is really um something that really brings me on to the last part of the talk which is really about how do we improve the utilization of registries or trials to really meaningfully impact patient care and this is something that uh, you know if i'm being very honest I, i'm struggling with and i wrestle with and i really would welcome your thoughts actually as well um on this and i think this is really the the problem is is the traditional randomized control trial I, I really love this picture by the way this is just before we went for dinner with my parents-in-law and you can see it's see my kind of um misery but it's fully echoed in my children which, which i really love as well but anyway so this was a time trial this was a randomized control trial of minimally invasive versus open use objectomy in the netherlands this trial was a landmark trial published in the lancet in 2012 and what it did what it did is it led to a massive uptake in minimally invasive esophagectomy in the world, but particularly in the Netherlands, because of the reduction in pulmonary complications, which was dramatic. And so what I was interested in knowing was I wanted to know, okay, so you've done this trial in a really limited number of centers. In fact, I think there were only, there were six centers or seven centers that took part in the trial. So what does that mean when you, when you apply that technique to the 24 centers in your country? And what was interesting is, is that, um, pulmonary complications were dramatically reduced within the trial but after the trial when they tried to introduce pulmonary uh, minimally invasive esophagectomy in the netherlands it was associated with an increase in pulmonary complications so that trial has absolutely no external validity when he looks at the same technique implied that operate when the average surgeon is performing that technique and that is the achilles heel of all surgical randomized control trials involving a complex technique they are done in very specialized centers by very specialized surgeons, and they don't represent the average. And that and that's that's really the issue that we have here. So what you see in a surgical randomized control trial is that you see you see really standardization of surgical techniques. You credential the surgical experience commonly, and you monitor the performance of the uh, 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 during the trial. So it's really tightly controlled in how, how people are performing this type of technique. And we published this paper in Lancet Oncology again a few years ago now, but what this looked at was, was each of these kind of areas. And it showed that in actual fact, that if you credential the surgeons by volume or by operative reports, that reduces the in-hospital mortality within your trial, irrespective of anything else. So it's a really important thing as to how surgical quality assurance is performed within a randomized controlled trial. But the Dutch learned from that. And I think that's what's really nice about that country in many ways. And having worked there for the last six months, I think that, that, that they do lead the way in many ways in my trials in my field. So they did the Logica trial, which was a laparoscopic versus open gastrectomy trials. So this is an equally kind of complex procedure, pretty challenging. But what they did was, was they involved all the centers in the Netherlands, apart from two. They basically involved all of them. So they said, what we want is we want this technique to be used in the Netherlands. Um, and we want everyone to be able to be trained to be doing it. So they all went through the surgical quality assurance program. All the centers participated basically. And, and, and that was really important. But what was interesting is that the trial result was actually negative. They, they were powered to length of hospital stay and there was no difference in length of hospital stay. But this data we've just looked at, it's not published yet, um, but, but I think it's pretty cool because what it shows is, is that the gray, the gray box represents um, the, the trial period basically. And, and all of this data is from their national audit. And what you see is a dramatic rise in minimally invasive gastrectomy during the trial. And it basically goes from around, you know, 8% to over 80% in a less than 10 year period, which is which is amazing, really, in many ways. But what you really see is, is that, so the complication rate for minimally invasive gastrectomy was very high before the trial. Then it sorts to level off basically during the trial. So surgeons are kind of going through their learning curve. And, the, and the, the brown line represents open gastrectomy. And really, it's after the trial that you start to see the benefit in terms of a reduction in complications seen from laparoscopic gastrectomy. So what the point about this is, is that potentially surgeons were going still going through their learning curve within the trial, potentially. But it probably doesn't matter because the trial was used as a vehicle to safely disseminate laparoscopic gastrectomy within the country. So... In actual fact, they were committed to performing lap gastrectomy and they just wanted to disseminate the technique safely. So they used a randomized control trial as a vehicle to do that, which I think is very, very interesting for trials moving forward. And likewise, 
Um, I think when you think about designing randomized control trials in surgery, you really have to be careful about what you're doing. So the time trial, which I alluded to before, was the Dutch trial, and that looked at totally minimally invasive esophagectomy. So you did a laparoscopic abdomen and a thoracoscopic chest, which, um, which um, I know my colleagues in uh, McGill do a lot as well. It's technically a really difficult operation to do in many ways, and that's probably why you saw the adverse outcomes when they tried to apply it nationally. The alternative to that is to do a laparoscopic abdomen and an open chest, which is what uh, Christoph Mariette and, and I undertook as part of the, the MIRO trial. And this was the uh, trial which we published in New England Journal of Medicine um, in 2019, randomizing patients between an open approach and this kind of hybrid approach. And what we showed again was a reduction in, in complications. Um, and we showed a, a, a trend towards a improvement in survival. But the importance of, of this trial was, was that what we were very clear about was, was that we wanted to do a technique which the surgeons in France would be able to do after we did the trial. So there wouldn't be much of a learning curve associated. We just wanted them to be able to say, oh, okay, uh, we've taken part in this trial, or we maybe haven't taken part in this trial, but it's not that hard to do a laparoscopic abdomen, so we're going to do it anyway. And, and this is the data which is just about to be submitted now, but um, but basically looks at the, the after the trial, what it, what the outcomes were in, in French national data. And we looked at patients who had a, had a hybrid approach. And really what we showed was, we showed the same outcomes as within the trial, because there was a reduction in, in, in severe respiratory complications. And I think that's really important. When you start to think about designing your trial, you have to think about the external validity of the trial and who is going to actually be performing this type of technique. And this brings me on to, as I talked about, registry-based randomized control trials, which is really where the direction of change, because I really think by utilizing some of these cancer registries, we'll be able to really confer the external validity of the, of the, of the trials that we're talking about. And there are several examples, um, uh, from mainly from Scandinavia, but some US studies really looking at um, cardiovascular disease. But what I'd like to highlight is the number of patients that are able to be included within the trial, because it's vast. So I, I think registry-based randomized control trials uh, really is the interface between trials and epidemiology. And I think in, in, in upper GI surgery, for example, we are cancer. We're very ripe for it, partly because of the fact that we have several re national registries. We have an existing network. It's important to understand in low instance diseases such as mine, that this dramatically increases the power of your trials. Um, the intervention really has to be carefully selected though. And you probably need to have a hard endpoint like mortality or something that's routinely collected within your, your, your registry. And as I said, I think one of the most important things with it is that it, it, um, it allows you to can sort of adjust or, or sort of randomize to, 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 to avoid the confounders that limit several of the kind of registry-based studies that I've talked about. And also there's potentially less of a selection bias that actually hinders the external validity of a traditional randomized control trial in surgery. So with that in mind, um, I've designed and uh, will recruit my first patient on the 1st of June to Sarong. Um, so this is a, um, by the way, my heritage is Sri Lankan and our national dress is Sarong. So I'm very proud of this trial. It's basically surveillance after resection for esophageal and gastric cancer. We spell esophageal with an O in England, as I've alluded to. But essentially patients having an upper GI operation or esophagectomy or gastrectomy, will be randomized four to six weeks, four to 12 weeks after surgery to either intensive surveillance with a CT every six months for the first three years and an upper giant endoscopy at 12 months or standard clinical follow-up. This trial has been embedded within our national audit registry. So the survival data will be collected within this trial, which I think is a real strength of the trial to prove the concept of a registry-based randomized control trial in, in cancer surgery in the UK. We've been funded by the by our funding body, the NHRHDA, to 2.4 million. It's a large scale trial. Bear in mind there are only 30 centers performing this type of surgery in the UK. It's actually now got 27 centers, including 952 um, patients. Um, and I think it, I think that that's quite exciting for me. Um, and I think the the advantage of of, of those kind of trials or, or these kind of registry based trials is that it allows you to have a really large sample size to do some really exciting translational work. So. Part of uh, the work undertaken by one of my colleagues, Richard Owen, is around the value of circulating tumor DNA, which is obviously a hot topic in cancer. But no one has really made the link of whether or not you have a change in your circulating tumor DNA. Does that correlate 
truly with recurrence or not, at least in esophageal cancer and gastric cancer. And that's what we hope to do as part of this trial, which is whereby we'll take a blood draw at the same time as the patients are having CT scans and therefore be able to correlate um, um, uh, recurrence with true changes in CT DNA. And likewise, you can collect CT scans as part of a part of these kind of uh, trials to really give you a different data set um, and uh, potentially allow you to do some radiomics type analysis to look at prediction of, of recurrence in, in these kind of cancer patients, which is another avenue for work, which we're doing um, now in Oxford and I'm working with um, our big data institute to do that. And then I, I talked about a lot about video analysis, and this is the second trial that I that we have about to start in. Um, we just got the funding and we're about to start probably, I think, in October of this year. But it will look at patients who have um, gastroesophageal reflux disease, and it will randomize them to either the Lynx, which is a sort of a device that you put around the lower part of the esophagus, or a traditional fund application, which is a laparoscopic operation to control reflux. The advantage of this trial is that we will collect the video of the operation for every operation that's performed within the trial. So we're able to look at um, um, uh, both monitor the performance of the surgeons within the trial to say, okay, whether or not they're doing the operations well and feed back to them in real time. Also, surgeons will have to submit two to four videos before they enter the trial to make sure that they're actually of sufficient quality to be, to be part of the trial. So it's like a driving test before you enter the trial. The other thing that's exciting, I think, about this trial is that the longer term follow up from the from the links will be embedded within the NHS device registry, which is a really good thing because it will allow us to look at five year and 10 year and 20 year even potentially um, 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 sort of explantation rate and safety of the device. Again, we've been really fortunate by being funded by the NHR EMI this time for 2.1 million. Um, and it will involve around 20 centers across Europe um, and 460 patients, um, which is, I think, really quite an exciting avenue, both in terms of translational research from video based analysis and using that for quality assurance, but also in terms of embedding this type of work within registries. Um, and this is the registry, which I think is um, very exciting in the UK and will start very, very shortly. So to conclude, um, what I would say is that we have to move away, I think, from measuring traditional morbidity and mortality um, as, as surrogates of surgical quality. Um, I think patient reported outcomes are beginning to become increasingly important. Data is key and granularity is absolutely crucial to that. And I think registry-based randomized control trials are, are sort of the absolute future of this type of work um, moving forward. I'd like to thank all of my um, international collaborators over the years who've um, been close friends and colleagues, probably see Lorenzo Ferry up here. Um, 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 he visited a wedding with me in, in Amsterdam as well. And I'd like to thank you all for your time um, and I'll be very happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Saraz. And I, I think there's gonna be a lot of viewing on our YouTube channel, uh, if you'll permit that, just because uh, I, I think a lot of people will be interested and weren't able to come. Um, I'm jealous of your data sets. I'm jealous of the work you've done. Uh, but I think I'd, I'd like to first, you know, invite everyone to just turn on their cameras. We're a small group. And uh, Claire has a lot of uh, uh, good comments. Claire, do you want to do you want to um, sort of uh, discuss and talk about uh, some of the comments that you've put on the chat? I think they're they're It's better than me reading them out. Why don't you go ahead? <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, your talk was so inspiring. Um like the, the impact you've had with every of your uh, article that had a nationwide impact is uh, really, really inspiring. Uh, something, okay. I, uh, um, but perhaps you re re you answered in the, in the end of the talk, uh, you know, like how can we speak in an ethical way to patients about the learning curve of, 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 of providers? knowing that we are in teaching hospital and we still need to teach and we don't want all the patients to run away as soon as we speak about learning care. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but what you presented after with the video and all of that was very, very interesting also, but I, yeah. I will let it answer. Yeah, so look, I think it's, I mean, so, I mean, Leanne Feldman is obviously your, your chair of surgery. I think in many ways is leading the way um, with this type of work in many ways. Um, um, what I would say is, is that it, it, it's it's really important to be honest. So I think the honesty is, is absolutely crucial. So, for example, um, I went to Utrecht 
and I learned how to do robotic upper GI surgery. And now I've come back to Oxford and I and they've asked me to start a robotic program here. So I had to consent my first patient uh, three weeks ago for a robotic esophagectomy. And I was honest. I said, this is, he said, how many of these have you done? I said, in this hospital, none. In Utrecht, 25. And he said, okay. So do you reckon you're, you're happy with it? And I said, yeah. I mean, look, I'm happy with it. I said, if there's any kind of problem with this, there's someone in the room who will be able to help me um and that and that's and that so we have a proctor when we start and i think that's really important to be to be very honest about where you are the advantage of why i like video-based analysis and this kind of thing is that then i take the video out i take it home my mentor takes it home i sent it to my colleague actually in netherlands to look at it for me so he looked at it as well and he said five or six things i could have done better probably more like 20 but anyway <laughs> but yeah but it was it was a nice thing and then you were like okay fine um, and, and, and that's, I think, the way that you do, because you because otherwise, if you wait for the outcome of the patient in terms of mortality or, or recurrence, you're going to be waiting 90 days or five years to know whether or not you've done a good operation. But if you look at the video that night, you, you know. And actually, I, I don't know whether um, uh, medical specialists are, do we have this, you know, like this feedback, because I think. I haven't seen a lot of mentoring uh, in on on our clinical work, uh, and I would be eager of this type of thing. But I don't see many opportunity to rediscuss cases with colleagues, you know, and to be very specific on how I could improve myself on this or this case. So I, I find that very very inspiring to see that that you are actually already doing it and in a in a very precise way. The, the thing that I think is always important, so look, I, look, I'm a data guy, like in all honesty, I mean, I said I hate the word big data, but I am a data guy, and that's the honest truth about it. So so what when you have these kind of things, which are like, um, you know, video based analysis, or providing feedback, it's, it's, it's easier for some people, and particularly me, to understand if there's a metric associated with it. So for me, OCRA is a really nice, the observed clinically and moral analysis is a really nice technique, because it gives you a metric at the end of it all, you're able to score your performance based upon the video um, in different areas. And you're able to look at the areas whereby you made errors and they're graded as inconsequential or consequential. But but it doesn't mean the inconsequential errors aren't errors. You can still look at them and try to improve and it will constantly allow you to improve, which is, I think, the most important thing. But you have to be open to it. But yeah. Mohammed, do you have any questions or comments? So happy you opened your video. What well, kind of, oh, f so a few years ago, um, I remember NISQIP uh, data from uh, NISQIP analysis was released in the, uh, I believe it was the annals of surgery that suggested the trainee involvement in surgery was associated with, with poor outcomes, with a higher rate of adverse events. And 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 some some authors uh, replied. Uh, I personally think that that training involvement should only be in high volume centers, mm -hmm. um, based on the data by Berkmeyer and others and uh, the stuff that you presented. But my question is, I guess, how do you balance uh, the safety of training involvement um, with the need for um, continuous surgical education? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very hard question, in all honesty. And I, I think what, what it is, is that you, um, I, I actually disagree, actually, in many ways, which is that I don't think that training should be limited to high volume centers, um, if I'm being very honest. And, and to be honest, what is volume? Like, it's also, you know, in terms of are you talking about volumes of cancers, or are you talking about volumes of hernias, or or, or whatnot, there's a lot to be learned from 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 different, uh, from different approaches. But what I would say is, is that I don't think trainees learn by high volume. I think you learn by um, by being reflective about your practice. And that's what I think a lot of these techniques that I've talked about really force you to be um, quite, um, uh, quite, uh, quite um, reflective about what you are doing and your own practice, um, which is the most important thing. Like, I mean, I worked with um, George Hanna, who was my great mentor um, in Imperial. I worked with him for eight years. At the end of every case, he gave me a score out of eight. And he said, if you get eight, you have to retire or you leave. Um, and it was always like this, basically. So he used to tell me when he took half a mark and all of this kind of thing. But we always talked about the cases afterwards. And it was quite reflective in terms of our practice. So I have a, oh, yeah. a Sorry, go ahead, Mohamed. Yeah. 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 Right. You know, uh, I just want to say that I agree 100%. Um, like when you look at your surgical videos, you tend to 
you tend to identify areas, potential areas of improvement, and especially if like a mentor was able to go over the video with you. I think it helps a lot. So yeah. thanks. Do you have Shiraz the I mean, I'm 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 wowed by I know it's a presentation and you've presented certain papers and, and really interesting stuff, but it seems, you know, in here in Quebec and in Canada in general, we have our health administrative data. We have some data at the hospital level that we're working on better organizing, but it's not certainly not perfectly organized for research. So our health administrative data is quite good. We have a cancer registry, um, but we don't have, I don't think, or I suspect, we don't have the range of registries that you seem to be referring to. Like, could you walk us through a bit, you know, in, in the UK, how many disease entities, is it only in the cancer field or in every field? And are these registries, the registries we have here are often like our diabetes quote unquote registry or national surveillance program is really based on physician billing, diagnostic coding and hospital diagnostic coding and will derive them. But could you speak to that a bit? Because I think part of this is an infrastructural question and you know what are the investments and how does that work? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, so we have, um, so when you start to think about population level based studies, so we have um, HES, which is the hospital episode statistics, and that's basically a bit that, like an administrative yeah. data set. So that's why yeah. by paper, patients, uh, you know, the hospitals are billed, basically your billing data set. Yes. So all the procedures, you know, the kind of the, patient comorbidities are all collected within that. The second one that we have, uh, the second kind of level is the registries. And a lot of them are in cancer, but we do have quite a few around, um, from a surgical point of view, bariatric surgery, but also diabetes, cardiovascular disease as well. And in the UK, the thing that I think is good is in many ways is that we're quite reactive to when there's a problem. Yeah. So we had, we had a real problem with meshes, like uh, meshes eroding into the rectum and vagina being implanted. So the government, uh, last year said that we had to have a device registry. So that's the device registry which I'm embedding, embedding golf into. Mm -hmm. And what's really important about that is, is that any device that's put, implanted in the NHS, but also in the private sector. So the, the Achilles heel of British healthcare in many ways is, is, is private healthcare because mm -hmm. those hospitals are a bit like a black box whereby they don't have to put their data into any registry as it stands at all. Um, and um, they can their their kind of what's the word their governance about um new procedures is nowhere near as rigorous as what we're doing in the nhs so they, so they operate them. outside the nhs you have a parallel system because we don't really right. have that here yeah absolutely so we have a parallel that. system whereby surgeons yeah. can go and trial a new technique in that in that kind of sector but what the government have become quite keen about is that in actual fact now they said actually they caught on to it so they said in actual fact okay now if you're going to do a device it needs, if it's in the private sector or in the NHS, it has to be recorded. And then we need the follow-up data for those patients, um, partly because of the mesh thing, but also because we saw lots of problems with orthopedics as well. But um, so mm -hmm. so, so we have those kind of re registries as well. And then we have a primary care data set, which is sort of evolving. Mm -hmm. It started off when I did my PhD, it was around 7% of the national population. Um, mm -hmm. it's CPRD? It's more, that, uh, yeah. yeah, CPRD. Yeah. Now it's, it's at about more about 22%. Uh, but it's very geographically located. So a lot of primary care physicians in the south of England tend to put into CPRD. A lot of the ones in the middle of England and the north tend to put into Q research. So again, they're slightly different data sets. Mm -hmm. They give you a feel for what's going on in primary care. But again, geographically quite disparate, which is why you have to watch your socioeconomic status within those data sets quite carefully. But it sounds like the government is investing in the infrastructure and I assume providing the software or the funding for the personnel to enter the data. Is that, you know, so, like no, no. so, so they do, they remunerate to a certain degree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they, but they actually, the problem is, is that they fine you. <laughs> it's no? not that they pay you, they fine yeah. you if you don't put yeah. your data in. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so for example, in Oxford last year, we were, we were the highest performing Esophageal gastric cancer center in the country by outcome and mm -hmm. our data was really well collected we had a really good data manager mm -hmm. and then this year we lost him and then basically our data is really bad like in terms uh, of the way that we put it in so we're probably going to get a fine unless we sort it out and then because you get a cycle so you get another three months to correct yeah. it and yeah then we have to do that 
So, yeah. But do they provide you funding for the data manager at various levels, or is that left to the GP or whomever to figure that out? Uh, it's left to the G it's left. No, it's left to you. I say the GPs get paid by the by the amount of data that they put in. Okay. Uh, the hospitals at the moment, for example, with the cancer registries, we don't get that. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, what we do is we get paid per case that we do. So for it's a kind of an indirect way. So if we say, okay, um, uh, we we managed you know two hundred patients with esophageal gastric cancer, the government mm -hmm. say prove it. So the data has to be inputted to prove it, and then we get yeah. paid. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what do you think about that, Claire? You have the experience in France. Like, I, I think yeah. one of our big challenges and deficits is that, like, when I look at what happens in the UK, for example, there's such a closer linkage between, um, like you said, identifying a problem, seeking the data, and then acting on it. Whereas here, it often feels like it's just this long arc and, and things kind of fester for a long time until a small group insists a lot and then it may change. So is that a cultural difference? Like, I'm not sure, you know, uh, what so, accounts for it. Yeah. yeah. So I think, in, I mean, in France, I mean, France is an inter really interesting from a esophageal, esophageal cancer point of view. So because, I, I mean, I worked in Lille for um for a bit with Christophe Mariette and, mm -hmm. and um, they only centralized um, esophagectomy services um, about four years ago um, and they based it on an annual volume of four which is unbelievable if you bear in mind like in the UK we centralized on the on an annual volume of 20 um, mm -hmm. um, so um, I think culturally speaking in Europe we see real differences in cancer care um, and, and this is a really big thing actually at the moment Lancet Oncology have just um, brought together seven of the major uh, funders from Europe to really try to address the disparity in European cancer care. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, um, it's a real problem, definitely. So, well, I've kept you over time, but it was fascinating. And so I'm so happy Claire was here and there were a couple of other of our colleagues. We had a competing respiratory celebration day, a surgical day, but I know people will listen to this. And if you don't know it, Shiraz was going to come with that to us, but there were some family issues where he couldn't, but maybe in a few years, we'll get him here uh, at CORE and uh, at the MUHC. So thank you so much, Shiraz. And uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I really enjoyed it. Great. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.